So the way I'm going to do this session is I'm going to start with like you know absolute basic machine learning 101, right? Uh, the general problem what I've seen is the understanding what kind of problems you can really solve with machine learning. We're going to go through that, understand when to use machine learning, right? And then take the next step and see like what problem with a practical example, what problem we can solve. And getting getting into why we need deep learning, right? And then few examples for it, and then go into the code. Right. So okay. So that will be right. Pretty much. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's that's practical, right? Some people try to really look good, and some people try to kick your ass like Bruce Lee, or some some people try to be at peace, and I try something else. So. That's me, actually. Okay. So, jokes apart, that's me. Okay. So, I don't know, probably a few, few, few of us have like interacted before. Most of us have interacted before in my previous stint in Sama. This is my second stint. Um, I took a break and like went out, uh, ran my own startup, data log AI. Uh, we did some chatbots um, uh, building platform, my body. Uh, and then Rajiv and others reached out, so I'm here now. So, uh, so the role what I'm here is as VP of AI research and trying to optimize clinical trials. That's pretty much what we are trying to do. Okay. So I have my contact information. I do blog actively. So if you want to like take a look at that, a lot of information in that. And I do actually run a forum uh, called Idli. I should add an information for that there. It's called Idli, right? Uh, Indian Deep Learning Initiative. Uh, about 5,000 members strong uh, right now. Uh, we do a lot of weekly sessions and uh, uh, things. It's open for anyone. To uh, it's in Facebook. Uh, I'll add a link to Okay. So, I'll try to stay away from the scary robots picture as, I mean, uh, as much as I can, right? But you know these terms are being thrown around so much, machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning, all this things. So, VK is saying, can you come closer to the mic? They can't hear it well on the phone. No, no, there is you a can't, mic. You can't move the mic. The mic. Oh, it's not that no, 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 no. I think you just, you sort of physically move there. There's no other way. Okay. I'll probably shout. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's fine. Cool. So, yeah, uh, we, we don't know that, like, now there are the, these terms that have been thrown around so much, right? Machine learning, uh, deep learning, artificial intelligence, and all those things. But what is the actual difference, right? That's, that's some of the questions which I get asked so often. So that pretty much sums up to some extent what things are. None of this is actually new, right? It just they are going through like you know as as usual with any technology. There is a cycle where there's a hype cycle that happens. Right now we are going through that, but none of this is actually new. Some of these algorithms have been in existing or in existence from 1960s. Okay, what has changed? I'll talk about what has changed, right? And why there is so much hype and a lot of uh, for a lot of it is actually true, right? So. Uh, so that's a broad idea, right? Like artificial intelligence, that's a bigger bucket. Machine learning falls under that. Another subset of that is deep learning. That's the way I would uh, put it. If you, if you guys want, like you know, even a better explanation, uh, the way I would say is, in machine learning, the subject matter expert plays a lot of role, right? When I say subject matter expert, let's say like you know, um, you wanna uh, decide that like you know, uh, what time you have to start to office from home, right? Now, if you want to build a model for it, you know that if you have to drop a kid to school or whatever, like you, know, you will add that as a variable as part of things, right? Uh, so that is your knowledge which comes in the picture to model that, uh, to help you to model that problem pretty well, or learn, learn, use machine learning to learn the problem pretty well. But if an algorithm learns that pattern by itself, that is when we are shifting towards artificial intelligence. I'll talk about it. Right? Any questions so far? I mean, stop me if you have questions. Yeah. So uh, these are uh, kind of a mix of tools and a concept, or uh, um, you know, how? So it's, there's, there's, there's really nothing called like you know uh, the best part about the uh, deep learning community is it's very open. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of open source frameworks. Uh, I can't go through for some of those. Um, it's nothing called as like you know tools or framework. I would rather call it like ideas and algorithms. That's where I would. Do. All right. So it's not like you know that something which happens in a silo. Almost everything is open source. Like there's so much research going on. You took an example about uh, what time you should leave an office, right? Uh, again, I don't know if the same example 
kind of translates to diff three different techniques. But can you pick an example and, and walk us through how is it different from each of these different Sure, I will. I will. I have an example there. And I think hope we can that somehow. I think hurry, right? Um, I think the, the the camera, I think we've got in the camera. So I just want to make sure. For others. Um, okay. uh, so this is the absolute simplified version of machine learning, right? Let's say I have um, a salt and pepper, right? I'm going to sprinkle it on the table. Think of it like salt, pepper, right? So I'm going to ask you to like separate that. What you do, you draw a line to separate them, right? That's my, pretty much what machine learning really does is it learns this line. How to draw that line, where to separate it, that's what machine learning really learns. Uh, we all went through algebra. I think everybody went through algebra course uh, in your uh, probably, I don't know, mind was middle for some probably called elementary, right? Uh, we learned this equation y equals mx plus b. It's just like super simple. We never knew like what are the implications for it. The, the idea behind it is like, you know, you plot on an x and y axis and then you learn the value of em, right? Slope. Like there are different ways to uh, learn the value of slope. There's a formula for it, right? Or you can actually learn it in an analytical way through an algorithm. That's what machine learning does. Learns the value of it in an analytical way. Um, so the way you, how it learns to draw the the line to separate the, the classes salt and pepper, right? That's what machine learning really does. So in a in a very absolute simplified terms, if you want to say it, it's nothing but a glorified curve. With it. That term can be even used for deep learning. Actually. So another reason what I want to do is like not cut through all the hype, right? What is going on outside? Let others have the hype. For us, we need to know what these things are so we can have a lot of conversation with our clients or like whomever it is. Right? So we come out as pretty good compared to others. So that that's why I'm like you know giving all these um, stuff. Okay. So broad classification, right? So there's machine learning. Uh, in machine learning, there are two different kinds, supervised learning and unsupervised uh, learning. Uh, supervised learning, think of it like I have a hammer and have a screwdriver. That's it. Okay. So, if I have to, the example what I quoted before, right, put salt and pepper on the table. If you want to do that, that's a classification problem. Another example I can say is, oh, is it going to, is it going to rain tomorrow or not? That is a classification problem, right? Um, but if you want to predict what is the temperature tomorrow, that is a regression problem, right? It's a running number. Like, let's say 75 degrees Fahrenheit tomorrow. Is it going to be 78 or whatever? Right? You still fit a curve for it, but the output is a little different. Rather than saying yes or no, you're getting a running number out of it. That's what it is. So when it comes to uh, unsupervised uh, learning, there are a few unsupervised learning. I just have like one here as a string. The similarity metric, representational learning. Um, it's nothing but in case of supervised learning, right? You need to have data which is actually pre tagged. You need to have a history. Let's say um, um, I have an example later uh, to explain more about it. But what we call it as annotated data sets. All right? So um, let's say if you want to find claim fraud, right? If you want to train a model to identify claim fraud, the history of Whatever claims they have caught as fraud is important for me to learn the difference, right? We are learning to draw a line to separate fraud and not fraud. So for that to happen, I need to have that history. So that we, that, that's what we call as annotated data sets. So data is very important. Annotated data set is even important. So the analogy would be data is oil. Annotated is refined oil, right? Which we can actually use for things. That, that's what it is. So when you said this example, right? you are trying to find out whether it's uh, fraud or not. Isn't it also kind of predicting where uh, based and so predict the creation of so pre see um, uh, uh, predicting comes more from a forecasting perspective, right? Like you know, put a curve around it and all those things. Uh, when a claim is fraud or not fraud, I mean, like no, it's not exactly predicting. You are trying to say, right, infer from the data whatever you got whether it's going to be fraud or not. Not exactly prediction. That it's an inference. Uh, the term prediction, I mean, this is my understanding why the term prediction is uh, so loosely thrown around. Um, one of the main reasons is scikit learn. Scikit learn is like a really awesome library for machine learning, right? Uh, usually, you have two kinds of methods for you a fit for you to train your model and a predict. 
or you can get the inference out of it, right? Predict is literally used in a lot of uh, sense. Uh, for if you're going to ask me, I would say it should have been inferred rather than predict. <coughs> okay. So there are uh, different algorithms for supervised learning, logistic regression, decision trees. There is naive bias, uh, random forest, gradient bo boosting, extreme gradient boosting. There are like a lot more algorithms, right? Probably just can like you know, add a few more uh, in, in that. Um, again, right? All these algorithms are good. Um, we'll go more into detail. This, I mean, deep learning also comes as a form of uh, supervised learning. We'll go more into detail on that uh, aspect. But the these algorithms can learn certain things pretty well. But when it gets to really non-linear decision boundaries, it kind of gets, um, it doesn't learn that well. We'll see an example for it uh, a little later. Again, so unsupervised learning, uh, there are different aspects of like clustering, dimensional detection, anomaly detection. They say, like, I don't have a tag data set for claim fraud, right? This is actually, we used this in ERB uh, uh, last year. Uh, they had 140,000 claims uh, in total. Out of that, they caught only 500 us uh, fraudulent claims. So no supervised learning algorithm is actually going to learn the difference to draw a line to separate fraud and not fraud. So we have to like you know look at we use different approaches to solve it. One of the approaches which worked really effective is uh, anomaly detection. We looked at claims. What we really did is like we learned we we threw uh, a deep learning algorithm with it. What it really did is we learned the pattern for data for which it considered normal, right? When it tries to re then it tries to reconstruct the same same data, right? If there's a high error for reconstruction, then that means that, that a particular data is anomaly, the particular row is anomaly, that particular claim is an anomaly, right? They need to take a look at it. So there are different ways. So that's that's one of those uh, uh, anomaly detection ways. So, okay, so this is my practical example. Uh, for me, I like to like you know, think of it as a storytelling rather than like having a session. I actually like to run, okay, even though I don't look like I run, I really like to run. Okay? That's me doing a, a San Francisco half marathon. Last year, yeah. Um, so I like to run, right? But how do I decide whether I have to run or not, right? So there are a lot of programmers here. I mean, how do we go about solving that problem? You want me to call the programmer? If then else. Yeah, if then else, right? So. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So me, I'm. See, one reason I like to run, but I don't. I like to run the perfect way, right? So, I mean, that's the reason you can see me this way. Uh, I'm in shape, but round shape, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for me, right, one of the, uh, if you go the traditional approach to solve the problem, what you do, you want to check whether it's going to rain outside or not, whether it's raining outside or not. If it is raining, I won't run. If it, if it doesn't rain, yeah, probably I cannot run, right? Right now it doesn't rain. So, what time of the day it is, really, okay? So if it is at 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. or whatever, right, probably I can, uh, I mean, like, no, I won't run, I'll uh, sleep time. Uh, 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., maybe, right? 8 to 9 a.m., again, maybe. Uh, I have reasons for why it is a maybe. 9 to 5, I can't, it's office time, right? Unless until it's a weekend. So the rule starts coming in, right? 5 to 7 p.m., I think I can run, right? At that time frame. 7 to 9, I can run if it is not too dark. So that's, that's the rule, right? 9 to 10. After dinner, I can't go. Yeah. So the next condition would be: Do I have to drop my son in school? Right. Seven thirty to eight. Uh, Stipulated time. I can't run. I have to drop my son in school. Same time, if I have to pick him up from school, four forty-five to five fifteen, probably I can't run. Right. Uh, unless until my wife is picking him uh, up. Uh, other times, maybe I can run. So, what is the temperature? Again, I said like um, I like to run in the perfect condition. Right. Fifty to eighty degree Fahrenheit. I'll run. Eighty-two. 110, too hot, I'm not running. 0 to 50, the reason why I put 0 to 50 is I live in Michigan and Pennsylvania for a long time, right? So I have to take the cold weather into uh, and then, There are times when we ran, ran even like when it's sub zero, different, crazy, right? Uh, but 0 to 50, probably I'm not running. Okay? So there are too many permutation combinations to solve this simple problem, right? Whether I want to run or not. Okay? So if you put a truth table out there, right? This is a truth table, right? And you want to put a truth table out there, like uh, these are my different conditions time, rain, school drop, temperature, and run outside. Okay, so 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., yes, raining, school drop, no, temperature 50 to 80, I can't run, right? 10 to uh, 5, no, no, 
and uh, uh, it's not raining, I don't have a school drop, 50 to 80, I can't run, it's too dark, right, it's my sleep time. 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., again, no, no, and 50 to 80, yeah, probably I can run, right. So, there are so many permutation combinations, it's like four, uh, four, or four different uh, variables or parameters, you'll probably end up with more than 20 permutation combinations, right. Think of it, a scenario where, like, you know, I'm even more picky, okay. I have 100 variables for me to like you know, decide like, whether I want to run or not. Okay. So, essentially I don't want to run, so I want to give every, every reason in the book to say I don't want to run. Right? So, if I want to come up with something of that nature, then you can't code for everything to solve that problem. Okay. Now we see why things are failing, right? In a traditional uh, software, that's the way we really like to solve a problem. We go through all the rules, we come up with it, we like, you know, write code for it. Like, I mean, you can call it object oriented, you can call it procedure or function oriented, whatever it is, still it's an internet, right? That's what it all boils down to. So, uh, I can't like, you know, really write so much logic to solve that problem. Rather, I can take a different approach to solve that problem. How do we go about doing that? Answer to this particular problem is machine learning, right? I mean, how many of you have Fitbit, Fitbit or uh, Garmin, Apple Watch? Okay, so yeah. So now, what you can do is download that data, right, and train a model on it. There's a historical data already, right, when I ran, I can use that. And there is data when I didn't run, right. So I can train a model on it to help me to decide whether I want to run or not. Does this make sense? Or any questions? Okay. So essentially you flip the condition, right. You use the rules to solve the problem before. Now you're flipping it and saying like, okay, you use the business rules, you learn the business rules from data. Essentially that's what it is. That's what it boils down to. This is supervised, right? It, it boils down to learning the patterns from, learning the business rules from, uh, from data. To solve the problem. Any questions? Probably you guys understood or <laughs> going over there. <laughs> Okay, so this is more like you know more targeted towards a product manager uh, kind um, kind of person, right? Look, um, so too many rules or if you face a client, right? Like, you know, um, you, this, these questions will be tend to be asked so much. So, uh, what kind of problems can be really solved by machine learning? So that's something which you need to think about, right? So too many rules to be solved effectively effectively by a different style of programming. So when I say first style of programming, we just saw an example, right? Five or four different variables, we have so many permutation combinations, we keep adding more, you will end up with so much. That's why you see some of the systems don't work well. You have like so many rules, right? Uh, to the end, you keep changing the rules, it's going yeah. to mess things up. Okay? You have access to data. Okay, that's the key. Without anyway, so that, you can't do much with machine learning or whatever it is, right? Uh, the third rule is repetitive tasks that can be solved by a human under one second. I use that as a thumb rule. It's so repetitive. It falls for automation too, right? But it, 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 it works for automation too. But in this case, <coughs> repetitive rules, repetitive tasks solved by a human under one second and it cannot be solved by an infant's study program, right? So that would be a classic thing. Uh, the next two things are like, you can't solve it any other way. Unstructured. Uh, Wait, sir. Is it coming from there? Okay, got it. Okay. So, un unstructured text, right? Um, text is a very, uh, I mean, rule, it's rules driven, right? If you want to solve text, I mean, you can say, I can say the same sentence a little differently, you could probably say it a little differently. Murli Krishnan will say it a little differently, right? Since we all think differently on that perspective. Same sentence. So if you try to solve that using uh, the traditional approach, it's not going to work. So unstructured text, that's where, uh, uh, like, you know, that's a classic natural language processing problem. That is deep learning. That is not even machine learning. That goes clearly into deep learning uh, section. Uh, have you guys seen the smart reply from Google? The, the option what comes in your Gmail, right? That's actually a really good. Uh, it's actually, the, if you look underneath, it's nothing but a machine translation based. So, it's how, it's a the same algorithm which was, which was used to translate English to French or whatever. The, the language translation, that's the algorithm which is being used for that. 
of course sequence sequence so it's it's kind of quite interesting images right this is classic uh, uh, convolutional neural nets right no other way to solve it uh, too many rules uh, if you want to try to solve it so the most most of the advancement what you have seen in the past couple of years right if you have read the news and what not and all those things that all comes from uh, deep learning unstructured text cnn uh, and uh, the game which is optimization problems right uh, so op so that that's reinforcement learning uh, alpha go or deep mind right so optimization problems uh, in in any time you have to deal with an optimization problems that comes under uh, machine learning or deep learning side of things too you can solve it little uh, effectively on that reinforcement so I uh, high level question that uh, this came out of our broker discussion. So I just want to ask that question uh, here. Uh, first, the set of examples were very clearly classification problems. You said I'll learn whether I should run or not run and stuff like that, and I'll use all the deep learning to create the business rules so I don't have to tell the, each and every rule. Rather, machine will learn the rule and now it will tell me whether I should run exactly. or not. So that is, I think, very clear. It is in my mind. Uh, the question I had was that based on these examples, if they wanted to uh, find patterns in data. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so. Uh, 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 typical example being asked is that can machine learning tell me ten things, ten patterns it can find for me, where two or three I already knew, two or three are uh, are uh, completely nonsense for my business, but two or three are like, oh, I never thought about that. Uh, like what example they were giving. Let's say I feed sales data to to uh, yeah. a deep learning and uh, and uh, it will tell me that uh, that I found a pattern between uh, a salesperson calling a client on a Friday evening and that deal being closed versus because they have a personal relationship and that person called at 7 in the evening and, uh, and, and that's likely, deal is likely to be closed. We never thought about looking for it, it identified is that is that a potentially a deep learning example it, or it's not? It is right uh, to one aspect of it. What you're really asking for is like you know what features really play a role, role in, the uh, in uh, solving a particular problem, right? There are different ways to achieve that. Either it's machine learning or deep learning, whatever it is. Uh, the one approach what we use is what we call it variable importance, right? It's a plot. Um, you look at it to see. Let's say uh, I'm trying to come up with uh, uh, like what I'm really trying to is learn the rules from the data, right? The example of the equation, what we really saw is y equals to mx plus b, right? So if I'm going to write it a little differently, if I have three features, right, um, for me to play a role, I would write it as y equals to m1 x1 plus m2 x2 plus m3 x3 plus a bias, right? So let's say um, a salesperson calling on Friday, um, I mean, like, you know, probably influences them to, to do it better or whatever. So Calling is one feature, right? uh, maybe like emailing is another feature or whatever, time is another feature, right? So, if the value for m, if, if this value for m, let's say, we are just learning the equation, right? Let's say it's 4, uh, x1 plus uh, 2.5 x2 plus 10 x3 plus b, right? So, the value difference between uh, different uh, features, right? The coefficient value difference between different features that will show what features actually are act playing a role. So that's it's it's, it's doable. Right? So, but still, even for that, right? Like you have you're still going the supervised learning route. You want to know what calls got closed and what calls didn't get closed, right? When the calls were closed, you want to understand, learn the pattern from that to see why that thing happened. So different ways to solve the problem. This is like a really, really simple example. I'm simplifying it. But uh, and and uh, this, this might be a later discussion. But uh, but the point is that at least so far, all the things that at least I've read told, tells me that neural nets actually hide this from you. So if deep learning is neural, neural net, you're not exposing the weights, then uh, then we'll never know what the coefficient was. Good question. Um, if you've read that previous blog, what about line was meant for that? Okay, so interpretable machine learning model. So that's why it, it goes into. It. So one of the key things is right. Like, um, so this is very simple, as you said. But uh, if you want to know why certain decisions were made, why what really influenced it to make that decision, right? You need to understand what uh, uh, I mean. What's really going on in the model? So there are different ways to uh, do. It. There's a global way to do it, right? You want to understand every bit, bits and pieces of it, or there's a local agnostic way of doing it. 
the line is one of those approaches which is local agnostic way of doing it. What it really does is like you know it moves the data around. Let's say I have a, a, a sales trip calling them at like you know 5 p.m. on Friday. Probably they are not going to close the call, right? So it will move the data around from 5 p.m. to let's say like 9 a.m. or whatever. It will put different values in that and try to see what's really going on, right? And why that it made that decision. Okay? So that's one way to understand uh, uh, things. So interpretable machine, machine learning models or deep learning models are a key. Um, it's still in very, very rudimentary stage for that uh, understanding to work. Or uh, people are, it's a very active area of research. Uh, this particular paper was published by Carlos Gustin, uh, <coughs> uh, Dewey, got acquired by Apple. Um, uh, and uh, there is Professor Bean Kim, uh, she's with Google Brain right now, there's a lot of research from her on this particular uh, space, interpretable machine learning model. Uh, so that will give you an understanding why certain decisions, decisions are made, right? But if you want to understand why every layer went through, that's no way. I mean, like, uh, that's not being found it, to be honest. Um, for few models, but convolution neural nets, uh, you can, to some extent, why certain decisions are being made. Uh, there is a tool by Jason Yosinski. Uh, uh, he was a geometric intelligence, got a credit uh, University of Wyoming. So that tool is actually pretty, pretty good. So, yeah, they, they use something on that nature. Okay. Any questions? Got it. So now, it goes into why deep learning, right? So we saw an example earlier where things were like clear. Okay, that's a plus if you guys want to go and see, right? As a minus, that's a plus. You're just gonna draw a straight line to separate things out. Let's say you are like my. This is like my son, right? He, he generally messes us up. Is uh, gonna if he's gonna do it, he'll put salt here and throw pepper around it. So if you want to ask him, uh, an algorithm to learn. So how to separate that? Right now you just draw a circle. Learning a circle for a machine learning algorithm is extremely hard. Right? It's curve fitting. As I said, it's curve fitting. Right? And if you want to come up with a curve fitting to understand where the decision boundary is, it's pretty hard. So when you want to do something of this nature, that's where deep learning comes into picture. If you want to learn a non-linear decision boundary, something which is not a straight line. Does it make sense? Uh, uh, text images, classic. This is more for structure data. Right? Text and images are this way. There is no straight line uh, separating things. We like to simplify it, right? Like you know, a lot of our decisions are very simple. But when it comes to uh, other decisions, we want to make a complicated decision. We want to wrap things around, like you know, push one one on another. Um, okay. So, what do we really do in deep? Right? This is actually very famous thing uh, around, like, you know, if you go to forums and stuff like that, this gets thrown around so much. Okay? So this is what the society thinks, right? even Elon Musk thinks that's what we do, right? So uh, that the robots are going to come and uh, uh, take over the humanity and stuff like that. Uh, okay? What my friends really think I do, right? Put a brain on a computer chip and try to make it intelligent or whatever, right? Uh, what others think I do? Pretty much, right? Sleep on money. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. So if you go to the other extreme, mathematicians think that I'm just a dog, right? Like you know, uh, try to uh, do something, right? Uh, what I think, if you don't know who this person is, that's Yang Yiku. Uh, uh, he's the one uh, uh, who's credited for finding CNN uh, for images, image processing. He's the one who made the major breakthrough, 1985 to 1995. That time, right? Uh, AT&T, Bell Labs. No, so pretty famous. So he is with Fair, he runs a Facebook Air Search Group, you know, right now. Uh, in New York University and uh, so that's the only point. That's what I think I do, right? Um, I'm smart as him, but not. Um, what we actually really do, right? It's Python code. Break it down, it's Python code. That's all it is, right? Cut through the hype, this is what we really deal with. Okay. So if somebody's gonna ask uh, 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 I mean, like, you know, uh, you come and ask you that, hey, like, you know, the robot going to take over the world, right? Can it draw a better line? That should be the answer uh, back, right? To separate things out. The the funny part is, none of these models are linked together, right? All this, these are, like, separate models which you train for doing one thing and one thing really, really well. 
and you try to make it do something that is wrong with it. So, is it also like uh, you know, machine learning Somewhere deep learning is more self-driven, you know, it eliminates the human aspect to it. No, I mean, it just learns things better. That's the way I would put it, right? Uh, uh, so, if, I don't know, we saw that circle example, right? Like, so, I have all the pluses here. Uh, I have minus around here, right? So, if I want to draw a line to separate this, how they go about doing that? No line is going to, so if you want to draw a line here, so I still get like a lot of false positives, false negatives, and it's not acceptable. Let's say I use vision trees or something like that, where I'm going to say segregate things this way, right? Still, it's not going to do a good job in separating things out. For non-linear vision model, whenever we deal with something of that nature, it is little better. And whether something is non-linear or not, that comes from like, you know, your understanding, uh, what's the accuracy level you're seeing by training other models on it. Um, that's the way we go for it. There's no hard and fast rule saying that, hey, throw deep learning at this problem, like for structured data. Like, throw deep learning at a problem or throw machine learning at a problem, right? It's mostly the intuition of the person who's working on it, their experience, their domain yeah, knowledge, a lot of things. So you're saying, if we are having a conversation with that customer, sticking to machine learning, uh, you know, you're still like, in the boundary. <laughs> Yeah, it's still within the world, right? Uh, but the data set is complicated, you know. See, any problem that is solved by machine learning can be solved by deep learning, okay? But the problem, the only thing is, it's like taking your tags to a, a knife battle, in a knife fight, right? I mean, literally, that's what you're trying to do. You're role processing, yeah. So you, you are aware of this. <laughs> you understand the, the problem that the customer has, yeah. it can be solved than I But customer wants to bring the tank. Yeah, no, that's no, okay. Or, or we want to sell a tank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I mean, he's right in the base. <laughs> no, I, I get it, right? Uh, sometimes uh, it, it plays a role and they say that, that's what I want and we don't know what they want. I want it for future, right? So, yeah, I mean, like, you know, uh, the customer is always right. On that person. I'm going to need a tank eventually. Why are you selling me a tank right now? Yeah. So, that, that's a good thing, right? Um, so, that, that that's what it is, right? Um, so, can you guys tell me like some practical examples where we have seen deep learning? I just want to make it a little bit even more interactive. Looks like I've seen a lot of people sleeping. So, <laughs> 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 so can, you, can you run an algorithm to figure out who's sleeping? Game prediction. Where, so, okay, yeah, I'll yeah, look yeah. Up one. Uh, anything else? Image processing. Okay, image processing. Cool. Uh, practical examples where you have seen. There was some website uh, where it, like, you upload any picture, it will predict the age of the Okay. Yeah. You guys use, oh yeah, that's true. You, you guys use Facebook? Yeah. Right? Your news feed, that's AI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody is saying face detection. Yeah, face detection is, yeah, it's AI. Nowadays, yeah. Google has started processing images, right? It has your old pictures and has your new pictures. It actually takes your kids and it, it detects that this kid has now grown to that age. It shows you yeah. before and after pictures. Yeah. So it, it does that. Okay, image, classic image. So any example on text? Uh, so yeah, Netflix, that's one example. Netflix actually, like Netflix recommendation engine used to be based on uh, metrics factorization. Um, but now things are changing uh, even in there. Uh, uh, and they're more moving more towards uh, deep learning side of things. Tesla car processing, right? One of the things that I have seen, uh, yeah. like Google Photos, right, can find of my daughter or something like that. I think it's fine if I actually saw it, find a portrait photo of the daughter's screen. Or I put on the, as my daughter, I know surrounding everything else. Yeah, that's special. That's classic deep learning, right? Tesla car, yeah, that's uh, deep learning actually, right? Uh, any other example? Uh, identifying the fake news, right? There's, there are certain uh, Websites, they provide API services <laughs> where you just put in a URL, it tells you whether the news was authentic or fake. Yeah, that's snow, snows and other right. things, right? Um, so that problem is actually very close to uh, for me personally. Uh, I mean, we, I, I'm from Chennai uh, originally, mm -hmm. India, right? Like, now we had this massive flood in 2015, uh, November 2015. Um, so we have two floors in our house, the, the first floor got completely submerged. Okay? Um, so the government machinery failed. And usually, the volunteers were the ones who were helping people to, uh, like, you know, survive or whatever. Uh, 
somebody spread a fake news uh, saying that like there's a crocodile farm in Chennai that crocodiles <laughs> escape into water. Yes. It's funny now, but when you look at it there at that time, right? Like it, it was scary, right? People volunteers were getting into water for. I mean, I, we don't know how many people's lives were lost or what not. Um, so that's some problem which is actually very very close to uh, my heart. I'm part of a group which is actually trying to solve the problem too, uh, like little differently. Um, uh, uh, different ways to solve it, right? Uh, fake news. I mean, right before at least it used to be spread a lot through Twitter and Facebook. Open thing you can do a, a lot of um, uh, mining. I mean, around a lot of smart rules can be brought around it and stuff like that. But with the the advent of WhatsApp, it has been like you know a little tricky. It's not open, right? So right now, all the rumor mongering or fake news are getting spread uh, through through that thing, um, uh, messaging platforms rather than actual social media per se. So yeah, uh, you're right. Snopes they they use uh, deep learning. Um, uh, Facebook has been very active on that uh, area uh, research. Um, mm -hmm. Anything in defense? Lot. Okay, uh, I can give you one example. Uh, uh, where uh, I was part of uh, something where we had to, this was way back, right? Even when things become, uh, it was not even norm using networks. Uh, we, so when you look at C, right? Like you know, there's no sharp features. When when anything something is sharp in that, that's actually a man-made object. Okay? So uh, we had to find that sharp uh, things in. Uh, that's actually a classic deep learning uh, thing, it's image processing stuff. We had to use Calvin filter uh, at that time, more a signal processing kind of technique to, to solve it. Uh, second degree Calvin filter. Uh, a lot. You can do a lot of stuff. Uh, see, cyber security actually is an anomaly detection kind of a thing, right? Um, uh, what you do is you look for anomalies. Um, you say hacking doesn't happen immediately. You they break into uh, something, they wait dormant, they lie dormant for like, a week or two, right? Then they go after the system and <coughs> pass or whatever. That's the usual track and how uh, hacking really happens, right? There may be a lot more uh, ways. So anomaly detection is actually one way to find, like you know, you log in that account is not active for two weeks or whatever. So you know the normal pattern for account, then you don't know, you know, you know uh, then you can like run a model on it to see what is not normal. To get it, that's unsupervised. That's one way to actually find it. should have used that. Maybe now they're looking at the patterns of the user. That's a class action lawsuit file now. On them, yeah. Deriving new stages in a game based on the game's data. Yeah, and that's in the stage, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's kind of yes. Okay. So, quick background on deep learning, right? Uh, so neural networks, Haka Perceptron, Perceptron, I don't know, probably that uh, uh, name will like thrown on, right? Perceptron, uh, MLPs, uh, multi-layer Perceptron, that's how it used to be called before, okay? They have been around for a uh, long time, 1960s. So originally it was designed to like little gates, right? Little physical gates, like move things around to find, uh, pretty much that's kind of contributed to the gradient descent evolution too. You don't know how much you have to tune, so you keep tuning it till it works. That, that kind of an approach. So that was one. Um, it, so there was an AA spring, then it went through a long winter. A, there was a long AA winter, right? 1985 to 1995, there was a there was like a lot of research was happening. It was like really hard to work on it and all, all, all those things. So Yang Likun, Bill Labs, uh, ADT Bill Labs, they, they contributed a lot uh, to this area, right? But after that, it kind of stopped. Really nothing. And from 95 to 2012, right? Uh, that was the time when, like, you know, support vector missions or all this classic machine learning algorithm, Berkeley played a lot of roles uh, uh, in that. Uh, um, so, I mean, if you take any major conferences from 95 or 96 to 2012, uh, like NIPS or like, you know, ACML, uh, ICML, whatever, right? Like, you know, none of the papers were really from deep learning or your network perspective, it was all classic machine learning uh, approaches. That worked at that time, right? Um, then, what really changed now? Why is this hype? Why is this buzz around deep learning right now? Any guesses? There were more hackers in the cloud, more processing power. Data is available, yes. Internet contributed to it, you can say that. 
Okay, anything else? Yes. Yeah. How many of you are gamers again here? Any gamers? One, two? That's it? Wow, okay. Thanks for you guys. Right? I'll show, I'll say why. Right? So GPU, yeah. So, uh, as I said, algorithm didn't really change, but the computation methods changed. Some of the algorithm what we use for CNN, that later, that paper, the idea came out in 1989. The algorithm what we use for text processing, NLP, that came in 1997. Yeah, it's 20 years anniversary for that. Um, algorithm didn't really change, the computation method changed. This was actually one of the paper which kind of like changed things so much. I, I have the data backing it up. I have next slide here. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so, Alex Rutschowski, Elias Skiver, and Jeff Hinton. Jeff Hinton is the guy for uh, our deep learning, right? So, they used NVIDIA GPUs to do um, image net. So, it's very funny. Um, I remember I used to work in Optima at that time. We had like a lot of data, a uh, huge cluster, Hadoop cluster. Uh, and it takes ages to process that, right? Like, you know, even if you have, I mean, uh, this was even before, uh, like, scikit-learn got matured uh, enough to be put in a lot of stuff. When you, have, when you have to deal with that kind of uh, volume of data, you have to write a lot of things from scratch, which we went through. I mean, uh, the I mean, I ran an algorithm, I went for vacation and came back, this algorithm was still running, and the process was still running, right, for month vacation to India, I'm not even kidding, right. So, there are times where, like, you know, it takes so much time for it to happen, process data or whatever, and you need, like, huge uh, a cluster of machines for you to help you. And I read this paper actually in 2014, like, mid-2014, end of 2014, I don't know exactly when I read it, I read the paper in 2014, and I was like taken aback by the <coughs> way that they actually did everything on two GPUs in a single machine for which would have needed at least like 4000 CPUs. That was the shift. That's the shift that happened, right? Uh, uh, I, I know probably a lot of guys have some stocks here, right? If you haven't bought NVIDIA stock, right time it will still, it will still go up. Yeah. <laughs> now it will still go up. It's still in the climbing phase, right? You won't make like money like what you did year and a half back, but you still make a lot of money. You are being recorded and there are stock tips being you. No, I'm not kidding. Um, see, uh, that's the only thing that works for deep learning, right? NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, T G Google TPUs came out, but you don't have access to it. It's still in alpha stage. They have buy it what not, right? So I will uh, place an order for all of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tensor processing. Instead of the number you start, it's uh, NVIDIA stock coming here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, that that's what the the background is, right? So NVIDIA GPUs are the only thing which works. So. Yeah. so Starting in the supercomputer that you normally play, right? Yes. So, I mean, was that not, um, I mean, yep. exploitable so, or? No, so ma massively parallel computers, right? You, you call it like MPA or whatever, right? Again, those are CPU based. So, if you look underneath for any machine learning algorithm, it's linear algebra operations. It's a dot product, right? Or a, 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 a element wise multiplication or an addition, right? That's what it really is. You multiply two matrix or two dot product between two matrix or whatever. So what really does that calculation really well? If you look at image processing, image processing is completely there. So that's the reason GPUs took off. And even now, even the other supercomputers are actually GPU based. Okay. So that's the data back. Actually, we published a research uh, as part of the forum what I run in Italy. We wanted to see when things happen and, like, and all those things. We wanted to actually really deep dive. Don't go through the hype cycle, but actually understand. So this was collected through uh, Scopus, analysis from Scopus, uh, IEEE, uh, NIPS, all those paper publications, uh, archive. We went through everything to come up with this particular uh, graph. So the code is actually open source. If you guys want to take a look at it, it's pure data analysis, thing, plots and data. So um, if you look at it, 2012, right? I know like till 1995 uh, to 2012, there's really nothing happening. 2012, See, it started picking up. That's when it really picked up. So we are still in very nascent stage. And by the way, that this is also based on the number of papers that got published, right? So papers are academic in nature or research in nature. 
the industry applications are just starting, probably for like past six months or a year. That's when I've really started keep, uh, uh, picking up. Till that point was you know, more more on the research side of things. Right? So from some overlap in these areas. Uh, we try to segregate it. We, we try to segregate it. There's overlap in this area. So that's the reason we looked at So there are tags when you publish a paper. Uh, you say what area your paper belongs to and stuff like that. So it gets to the right conference and things. So we had to go through that. So, so 2012 is when like, the, the kickoff uh, it really took off. Okay. So I talked about, uh, we, probably, we just talked about it, right? Uh, deep learning is computer hungry. Uh, it is linear algebra operation, so it works really well on a GPU. That is the, the key, right? So, I have uh, two machines at home, one running two GPUs, another one with four GPUs. Um, so, the one with four GPUs, right, it has the Nvidia Titanix uh, on it. So, one Titanix GPU has uh, 4000 cores, almost 4000 cores, right? Think of it like that's a thousand quad core mission. Think of the power, what the compute power, what you're really getting uh, out of that. That is what is making a difference now. Data and the compute power. Okay, that's that's pretty much like your Hadoop cluster, right? Or huge Hadoop cluster on one GPU. Oh, by the way, that's the DGX1, which uh, uh, NVIDIA sells 130k mission. They usually donate it to uh, Google Labs. Uh, OpenAI got one. So since they are doing cutting edge research, and they are really doing cutting edge research, and Musk, obviously, right? Elon Musk. What will this cost? One thirty k. So there's one thirty k, and they into one GPU. You could actually eight, buy eight, eight, eight GPUs. Eight, eight, eight GPUs. Eight GPUs, and it has K. K uh, so the one mission what I have, it can't do um, GPU to GPU communication. So think of it this way, right? Uh, I have one CPU. <coughs> I have four GPUs, right? So what I really learn is weights. Okay, so it all has to go back here. The CPU for like maintaining the base, the parameter of the server. Okay, but with DGX one, what what can happen is it can actually GPUs can communicate with each other. So it enables even faster iterative uh, iteration and development. So those were the SLI based uh, GPUs that the media released. So in 2007, they had one GPU card. The one, and yeah. they, then you can put a second card, second graphics card, and there was the SLA connector which can. You can use an SLA connector, but generally what uh, what we do is we use PCI Express for transferring data. Little better uh, on that. Front. So in PCI Express only now you have uh, two yep. slots available, right? There's a connector which can connect both the GPUs. Yes, but uh, from a HPC communication, right? From a, if you look at a proper HPC architecture, high performance computing architecture, you don't generally go into one, right? Like. Uh, you tend to put things, Cassandra, wow. like Cassandra kind of architecture, you put things around in the circle, uh, the communication always happens one way, right? But still the communication happens very well, so you don't transfer data across. So, uh, if you guys are more interested on it, uh, there's a really good paper from Sh Shubho Sen Shen Gupta. Um, he, works at, he used to work at Baidu right now at Facebook, uh, on like how to actually do these kind of architectures. It doesn't go like you know, really deep into deep learning uh, as such, Pure from architecture computing perspective is a good capability. So these are the uh, deep learning avengers, right? So Jeff Hinton, for good reason, right? So Yashua Benjio, Professor Yashua Benjio. Um, uh, he's the one guy who hasn't actually cashed out for the deep learning thing. He's the main guy, this is lab in, uh, you'll be surprised, as much as US is in this field, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, it's Canada which is actually leading. So, uh, Montreal, right, University of Montreal. Uh, that's where he runs a lab, uh, Villa, pretty good lab. Um, then, um, Prof. Jeff, Professor Jeff Hinton. Um, that's Jan Likun, right? Uh, that's Ian Goodfellow. Okay. That's Francois Sholey in the back. Um, Kiras, author, author for Kiras. Uh, he's in the back. That's Andrew Ng. Um, I don't know who, yeah, one really a subscriber I know, and the other person is, I can't really see. We didn't buy that. We didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> so there are different deep learning frameworks. If you look at it, right, people throw things out like, you know, can you do it in TensorFlow, can you really do it in um, uh, um, uh, Torch or whatever, right? 
They're nothing but uh, like a way to achieve or solve your problem. Uh, certain things are really good in some, some, some aspect of it. Uh, I mean, like when you want to go for production, operationalizing your model or whatnot, we tend to go towards CAFE uh, rather than TensorFlow. Other things is it gives a better performance, it's better and simpler because you can port your network over it. But for training and other things, you generally try to stick to one of these, right? Um, MXNet is uh, MXNet is uh, Amazon. Uh, Chainer is a Japanese uh, open source. Uh, uh, IBM supports that a lot. Torch, PyTorch is Facebook. Uh, Kira is open source, again, completely through, through, through open source. I'm, um, like, now I'm very close to Kira's. I built a community around it too. Uh, 2015, we started uh, that journey. TensorFlow, again, uh, now we're 20, that's when it's got released. Cafe, Tiano. Tiano is the grand old daddy of the economy. Tiano and Cafe, pretty much. Those are the old frameworks. And I say old, probably like four years ago. <laughs> Not that old. Okay. What do you hear TensorFlow the most today in the marketplace? Yeah, Google is backing it, so you throw things at it. Uh, I mean, personally, if you ask for like, right, PyTorch is six months old, or came out in Actually, PyTorch is a lot better compared to TensorFlow um, uh, for dynamic uh, uh, graphs. It's nothing but a DAG and uh, that's basically <coughs> graph. So we'll see that. Like, it's, not, it's nothing but like you know, it constricts a graph. When you go through forward propagation, then you have to follow the same path back, right? When you do back propagation. So, when you do that, uh, uh, I mean, like, TensorFlow is static in nature. You have to do a lot of stuff when you have to work with text and whatnot. PyTorch is really good for that. PyTorch, you can, like, set up every iteration and all of it's, it's really good. What is the comparison point between these? Uh, how do you even compare to say that this is better than No, Tiano. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, the reason why uh, people don't use Tiano much nowadays is you get an error, right? Uh, let's say shape error, you don't know where it's coming from. It's going to take you days to debug. Okay. The same team which ran or which built Tiano went to build TensorFlow. <coughs> so was very active in building Tiano, he went to build TensorFlow too. Um, so there are differences of that nature, right? Uh, Again, MXNet uh, has a lot of traction. Amazon supports it. Uh, AWS, as part of AWS, they push a lot of uh, things on it. Chainer is more on um, Nimbix, IBM, uh, Open Power Platform. They, they are pushing a lot on that, that area. Everybody has their own flavor of uh, framework. More like uh, specific to a problem statement? Not exactly. It's like more like me too. Right? More like me too. And Microsoft has actually a CMTK. CMTK is pretty good. Too. Miss that. Um, they, they are pretty good. Okay. So, so there are different flavors of deep learning or neural networks that you can see. There is recurrent neural networks um, used pr pretty much for text and time series data. If your current state is being impacted by the previous things that happened, for example, right? I uh, I had salad yesterday. I'm not, not going to have salad uh, today. I mean, like uh, that's not the way how it works for me, right? So uh, the decision what I did yesterday or what I uh, what happened yesterday is going to influence my decision today, right? So you have something in sequence that you need to worry about. So whenever you have to deal with something of that nature, you go to a different network. Yeah. What is, how do you relate deep learning? It is the same. It's a cup. It's the same. All right. Deep, so deep learning, I mean, when the term gets thrown around, it's nothing but like how many layers do you really have? How many hidden layers do you really have? That is what it uh, uh, really, really means. Is, is maybe another way to say is, is deep learning or Application of neural net. Neural net is a concept as a general, right? It could be done for. No, it, it is neural networks. Okay. Right? It is neural networks. Yeah. Let's say if I have something like this. No question is: Is that every neural net a deep learning, or is every deep learning every uh, deep learning is a neural net, but not every neural net is a deep. Learning. Exactly. If you so if you here right, this is a hidden layer one. I have another hidden layer two. So if you have like. MD. So there, there is jury out on that. I mean, there is no clear definition per se. But the general consensus, uh, I mean, in fact, I posted, I, I created a storm around that question uh, in the forum, what I learned. I uh, asked people to defend what is really deep learning. And it, it, <laughs> nobody was really able to agree on one idea. So the thing is, how many hidden layers? General consensus is how many hidden layers you really have that what determines whether it's deep learning or, or not. If you look at word to like word to like is actually a form of neural network, but it's shallow. It has only one one hidden layer. So, you know. so 
there are different flavors for uh, different different networks. LST my talks about 20th anniversary. GRU came 2015, uh, 2014, I think. Uh, Highway networks came out last year. Highway networks came from the same lab as what LST came from. They are pretty good uh, ideas, right? So this you this is the the trend right now, right? Everybody wants to go at reinforcement learning. It's the most sexy thing out in the the block. Uh, uh, it's cool since it's very fundamentally different from the way how you do supervised learning, right? Uh, so you don't need to have like annotated data set to go at it. It learns from it. So this is like more more research, still research oriented. You don't see a lot of practical applications hit out on the field. Uh, more like games and uh, optimization problems and things like that. That's where. Uh, uh, so this is a very interesting area. Uh, DeepMind is the one which actually brought it back up again to big, to a big. Uh, the AlphaGo, uh, I mean, it was huge, right? Uh, 20, 2016, last year, right? Last year. Yeah. Just last year, I think. No, last last year. I in fact have had a very specific conversation. Initially, early last year. Yeah, again late last year. So, this is, I mean, I think this is where the future is going. There's a lot of research is working on it. There's some labs really doing cool effort on it. OpenAI, um, Elon Musk's lab, um, a lot of smart researchers working there. Um, Bila, I mean, like, you know, Joshua Bilbo's lab, IT Madras. IT Madras is actually very unique. Uh, the reason why IT Madras is here. Um, is uh, Professor Balaraman uh, Ravindran. He trained under Sutton uh, and Bato, um, uh, their group. He went back to IT Madras, has been running the lab for 20 years. Uh, come out really big. Some of the really best minds are coming out from that, that lab. Um, okay, so we. A lot of theory. <laughs> <coughs> right, so you guys have things up. My Python notebook. If you guys clone it, you can get a GitHub link where you can go. Sagar, where is your laptop? I have a question. You have a very good score. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you repeat your question? Yeah. Uh, very good question actually. So, uh, you uh, mentioned uh, a lot of my question is how do we decide what is the number that you are going to So giving the number that you are going to get a lot more, right? So how do you how do you get that? How do you decide that you are going to be able to get Okay. Okay. So good good question, right? Uh, so one of the uh, one of the things uh, what you need to worry about is right whether yeah, one of the things what you need to worry about is whether you actually have to go and explain your model to someone else, right? If you need a model, if for example you you might you work in the insurance industry, right? You you have to like you know take a rate change back to a regulators and explain why this particular rate change has been done. Then you need an interpretable model. Then you don't have a lot of options: logistic regression, decision tree, or pain integration, whatever. That's all you can really use, right? Since people want to know why that certain decision was made, what not. Okay, so that is one aspect. Okay? Uh, then there are other aspects where, like you know, you are dealing more with a process improvement kind of a problem. So one example, what uh, Manish uh, and we were talking about is the claims fast tracking example, right? So that one is more of a process improvement. It's not going to really impact. Uh, I mean, you are trying to improve the existing process. You have data for it. So in those cases, you are okay to throw the throw the black box models uh, at uh, things. So that's the way I would look at it, right? Uh, in that, um, there are every algorithm has its own. Uh, Pros and cons. Not everything is going to give you the right kind of result uh, to start with. Uh, for me personally, right, I go for something called an ensemble model. Uh, I haven't talked much about it. Uh, generally, train like two or three models together, and and what I do is I average the results out. That's why what happens is uh, even if one model is bad or one model is really good, I tend to get a decent result uh, out of it. 
unless and until you are going for like you know some competition per se most of these ensemble models tend to work really pretty really well does that answer your question mohan so basically that you know, we we train the model we train multiple models on the yes. data set and see which model is coming out with the best answer yeah so that's one part yes. second you're saying that you can use combination of models as well yes combination of models yes. that's called ensembles or meta learners okay okay so you basically so uh, what do you mean by that like do you feed output of one into in input of another chaining that? no that's chaining right i'm not talking about chaining let's say the same data i'm going to give it as input to three different models i'm going to throw a random forest at it i'm going to throw an, uh, a gradient boosting at it i'm going to throw a naive bias naive bias classifier at it right three things uh, like you know the uh, result part that comes out of it for every row i'm going to average it right and it and divide by three okay so that's one way one way to Thank you. So, uh, were you all able to open Anak uh, IPython output? So there are few basic uh, building blocks for any deep learning uh, algorithm, right? Things what you have to worry about. What kind of activation function you are gonna use, right? Uh, then what kind of uh, loss function you are gonna use? Two things, right? And how many uh, layers you want to use, and how many nodes or neurons in a layer you want to use. Those are the the uh, decisions what you have to make when you are building uh, a model, right? So here there are different activation functions. The activation functions what people generally think to use with deep learning is the one way you can find a derivative for it pretty easily. When I say derivative, is nothing but finding slope, all right? Uh, that's what it is. Literally, it boils down to. Uh, Uh, so there are different activation functions. Uh, there is sigmoid, there is relu, there is tanh. The example what I'm going to take is sigmoid. In in like you know papers and other research papers and stuff, sigmoid is not being used anymore much. It's more towards relu or leaky relu. That's that's where uh, people are going. Uh, that's what is being used uh, currently. Uh, so have you sigmoid here? Uh, so if you look here, right? Um, Well, the guys on the phone. I'm looking at the first cell um, here. Okay. So the derivative function, right? Um, it's nothing but like you now it's going to take this into the derivative set to true. It returns the value. Otherwise, what it really does is it does an exponential uh, 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 epsilon. Yeah, yeah. Um, exponential returns that that value. That's that's what it really does. So the simple formula for it's a logistic equation. The simple formula for logistic equation is. One one by one over e to the power of minus uh, uh, x. That's what it is. That's what we are really doing here. And uh, you can actually do most of the work with NumPy. NumPy is really really cool. One of the things that came out from Python uh, open source uh, community. Um, the reason why you go towards uh, uh, TensorFlow or whatnot is for using the GPUs. Okay, that's the only reason you go towards that. Otherwise, you can do most other other stuff. Uh, with numpy okay uh, but generally you don't end up write, writing all this thing yourself uh, here as a tensorflow um, pytorch what will be the framework it has all these things uh, together okay so this is my uh, step one i'm importing numpy i'm um, um, defining a sigmoid function um, uh, it has a derivative uh, value underneath uh, if you go to wikipedia you can actually see the derivative uh, there it's pretty easy uh then the actual uh, calculation for the forward propagation is a uh, logistic equation right so generally what happens is think of it like a lego building block right i want to do a layer one what i do then i put my um, uh, activation function right then i put another layer right i put another activation function i put another layer i put activation function that's the way you keep building it so it makes a match So the data set what I'm going to uh, uh, use it's a synthetic data set, all right? Uh, so when I say synthetic data set, this is what it is. Uh, so there's like three uh, columns, four rows. The value what I'm going to predict is why I've de defined that separately, right? So it's five uh, or four columns, uh, zero zero uh, one one. Uh, so it's a classification problem which I want to uh, predict. So one of the main things what Uh, I know we we are jumping directly into deep learning. One of the main things what happens is something called gradient descent, which you need to uh, uh, know before we go to the next step. 
So what is gradient descent? Descent. Uh, exactly. How many of you actually hide mission peak? Okay, quite a lot. So you stand on top of mission peak, right? You roll. Imagine that you are rolling a ball down from mission peak. It has to reach to the lowest point, right? So how do you go about solving that problem? Do you roll it so fast that like you're going to miss the lowest point and keep going, or what do you really do? If you're smart, what you do is generally right. Like you take baby steps. Right? One step. Just want to make sure that you are going towards the lowest point. That's how your gradient descent works. Okay? So you take one step at a time and make sure that you are going in the right direction. If you are not going in the right direction, you update your base so that you make sure that you are going in the right direction. That's the way it works. Did the analogy work? I think it's a better analogy for getting stuck in Local. closer yeah. optima that aren't going to So it, yeah. So it's more like they say, I'm on top, right? So I have this little thing where the actual bottom is here. Okay? So if I'm going to uh, take, uh, uh, move fast, I'm going to get stuck somewhere here. That's not the actual lowest point. I want to go here, right? So I'm going to take baby steps to keep going until the point I'm, I'm reaching here. That's one way to explain uh, gradient descent. I'll try to send a better link, video link, I think YouTube link, that would be better to explain it. Uh, more more graphical in nature. Okay. So that is my uh, example x and y. What I really have is uh, uh, the next one is random seed, right? Uh, this is more to reproduce your result again. You know, uh, when you do random, if you don't give a random seed, if you try to do it again, you're not going to get the same result. If you want to have the same result, uh, you do that. Mm -hmm. The way I go about it is I generally put my uh, anniversary date, that's not my anniversary date, so I don't forget things, right? I never get in a, uh, an issue. Unless until I'm writing code, I don't have an issue, right? I'll remember it. Uh, that's the way I go about it. Okay. So, synapses, right? So, wh what did we do? We had, uh, let me draw this on a board here. So that is my input, that is my output, right? So what I'm really defining here is a is something called synapses, which connects this input layer to the first hidden layer. Then the next synapses is going to connect this to the output layer. I'm just going to use one hidden layer. That's what synapses are. So what I'm doing, I'm initializing that with random uh, ways to start with. That is what we are really learning, okay? And uh, so if you look at it, it's a dot product, right? So that's the reason I have three comma four as the first one, and the next one is four comma one. When you do a dot product, at the end you get like one one node. Okay. Um, epoch. The number of epochs is uh, okay. The classic terminology why we call it epoch is in machine learning. Whenever you define an epoch, you want to run for a really really long time. Okay. That's the reason we call it epoch. Uh, that's the terminology what uh, people use. Uh, they throw things around like that. That's what it means. Here I have defined it as 50. So I am going to do 50 iterations, trying to find the lowest point. Okay. So the way I am going to solve the problem is simple, right? So I need to sol solve this. I need to make sure I don't have a straightforward way to solve, solve it. I don't have know the value for m to start with. So what I am going to do is uh, take baby steps to find what value for m really solves my problem, which gets to me the point where like my error is really, really low. So we will see that. Uh, so what I'm what I'm doing here is I'm um, I'm iterating through if you press shift enter it executes uh, uh, in IPython. Right. So, so what I'm doing here is uh, the input goes into L0. Uh, L1 that layer is nothing but a dot product between L0, right? Metric multiplication between L0, the input, and the synapse 0, whatever we uh, initialize. Okay, so that is what it is. The next one, L2, is nothing but a sigmoid and dot product between L1, the one what we calculated before, right, and synapse uh, uh, 1, the one what we initialize uh, here, right. So that's what it is. And put a sigmoid on top. Um, then the error, what, what is the error we are really getting? That 
what the way we calculate it is like y. We know the value for y. So, I mean, like let's say the value is supposed to be one, uh, and for this row, and I have come up with like point zero zero one for it. I'm making like a lot of mistake. I'm not accurate enough yet, right? So that's what it is. L2 error is equal to y minus L2. That's what I I calculate. So that's an error. Okay. So I've calculated my uh, uh, error. Uh, I'm taking a mean of that. Um, then what I'm doing is how much I should update my uh, base, right? That's an issue. This is the back propagation starts coming in the picture. So I have moved from here to here. I moved here to here to find things. Now I I have made a good good way, right? Like you know, uh, made mistakes. So I want to fix my mistakes. So how how do I go about fixing my mistakes? That is called back propagation, right? That's that's the learning part for deep learning. What you do is you go from here to here, you update the weights, right? You go from here to here, you update the weights. And how much you update, the way you update, that is the. Uh, uh, so there are a lot of ways to do it. There are different. Uh, Time check ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. So there are a lot of ways to do that. Um, there is momentum. There is Nestor momentum. There is Adam Adam prop. There are a lot of optimizers which can help you uh, to, to do that. Gradient descent. Is, stochastic gradient descent is one of the optimizers to help you uh, achieve that. So. Uh, so what I'm doing here is right. I'm calculating still sigmoid. If you look at it, it's still a sigmoid function, but I'm passing the derivative value as true. So I'm calculating the derivative, the slope for it. The slope for uh, a sigmoid function is uh, what we define. Well, if you go to Wikipedia, you will get all this information. It is, it's very, it's there. Uh, okay. So now, now what you're doing is you have a. So we calculated error. First, for at, at this layer, right? We calculate error at this output layer. Now I want to calculate error for this this layer too, right? I'm I'm abstracting things out. Uh, uh, so so I'm cal trying to calculate an error here. So that's that's the one which is which is happening uh, uh, here. L1 error. Okay. So the weight update, whatever I need to uh, do, that I've learned as L1 delta. Again, passing it to more calculating with the derivative. So I'm updating my weights and I'm looping it. Uh, again, that's the way so it runs pretty fast. So you can actually see how it's like the error rate is like very very high to start with. It starts converging and the term converging, when they throw the term converging around nothing but like the error rate is going down. Okay. So you see this right, uh, it, it keeps uh, going down, it started at 0.507 or something and at the end for 50 iterations it's 0 0.21. Let's say uh, Try giving hundred. See the error rate is like started at point five zero or something. Which is like almost like a flip of a coin coming to do a, a prediction. But when you go down here, it's 0 0.096, whatever. So it's fairly accurate. Uh, but the problem is, like, you know, if you, you want to do it fairly accurate or whatnot, if you push it so much, it's going to memorize the data. If it memorizes, it becomes a problem. So there are different ways to tackle that. We call it regularization or uh, uh, dropout. There are different methods to, to, to handle it. So, what is the output after training, right? Uh, so look at it. So this was my data, right? First two rows are zero, supposed to be uh, zero, closer to zero, zero and zero, one and one, right? So this is where we use something called threshold value to like determine uh, what things are. Okay. If it's a threshold value, if you set a threshold value to say like anything that is less than 0.2 is equal to zero, then your model is actually 100 percentage accurate, uh, right now. No, it, it, it ran. Uh, the other one keeps coming up. So that's what it is, right? So now the, for the last two, it's like supposed to be close to one, and it is coming close to one. So this is a stepwise way of actually going about solving this. Um, this particular code can be pretty much written in two lines with keyless. 
you don't need to go through this this entire thing. Kira simplifies a lot of these things for you. You will quite touch about it, right? This is more to understand what are the things that really goes underneath. Probably a lot of things went over your head. Like take your time, go through the code again. It's actually fairly easy. So, so essentially, what we really do is like till you start looking good, we keep running it. That's what we really do, right? Uh, so that's really what it is at the end. <laughs> so that's your linear algebra, deep running or whatever, right? You pour your data through it. Okay. You keep selling things until it starts looking good from an answer's perspective. So that's, I mean, that's the reason why, why I want to bring these things out, right? Like, uh, let others have the hype. When we deal with it, we need to know what it can do and what it cannot do. When we don't talk to a client or whatever, we should promise something which is which is not doable from a deep learning perspective. That is a credibility factor. When the whole world is talking about things that way, right? We actually come out honest that sells better. People want to write more complex foreign data. For G we need GPUs for that. It's a cloud cloud based. So right now, what's so responsible? Maybe comes up with a problem that doesn't solve. So whenever some, okay, so good question. So if you have like a problem which you want to solve, which you think it needs deep learning uh, for that, uh, uh, based on the information what I shared, if you think it needs deep learning for it, reach out to me, that's one way. I'll help you or nudge you through that uh, process. Uh, it definitely needs compute power. Without compute power, it's not going to uh, uh, work. So for compute power, again, uh, I have access to compute power. Uh, Sagar was gracious enough to to a good budget for uh, using it. Uh, so reach out to me. We'll see how we can fit things in and that. And if it's a problem which can be fed back into uh, Luke's uh, products, yeah, uh, I think you'll be more than happy. <laughs> um, all right. Sorry, I know uh, Samuel called to step out, but uh, but I'm just going to make a point. I I see a lot of people here. Some people who have done this before, uh, just uh, taking benefit of uh, going through this code a few weeks back myself for one of the uh, people who understand it better and I, I want to be very clear on that, will explain the nuances which on the first pass, because I was lis listening from that filter point of view, that might be kind of new, right, uh, sigmoid function and uh, uh, derivatives and why we are doing and stuff like that. So uh, 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 what I would like to do is just just repeat exactly what Malai said, but just, just correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, fundamentally, what you're doing is that he's drawn that multi-layer uh, uh, neural net there that you're putting uh, at random certain inputs. So you put in the inputs that you want to, or not at random. You have inputs which are your uh, what you which is your input parameter. Then you put random weights on the first layer, and through multiple layer you are coming up with an output. Let's just stick to that one. So some output came up. Then you compare it to a known output based on derivative function, and this is something you will have to read and figure out why it is doing that but it will point you in the right direction. By doing derivatives, what you're doing is you are finding out how I should adjust the weight in which direction to get closer to the answer. So that's the back propagation that Mala was talking about where you go and adjust those weights. And you keep going through that process iteratively till you reach consistency in the answer. Uh, and hence, you will never get a 1 for a 1 and 0 for a 0. You'll get 0 0.93, you're getting closer and closer to the answer. So ultimately, what you're doing is you're adjusting the weights on each node, but in a very smart way, rather than doing every computation combination, which will be just computationally impossible. You are adjusting the weights so that the output gets closer and closer to what the real output is. Once that system has learned, Next time you put in the input, without knowing the output, it can predict the output. That's that's what we just saw, what we saw. And so the right weights are the final outcome? Yeah. Right. So, so, the, the, so, so the, that's the learning part. Right? For the learning part. Yes. For the learning part. Yes. Yeah, I think most of you guys were here, but that's exactly right. I think uh, what Mutuza and uh, Pratik did in terms of that uh, car and the ball. So that's a little different from the example what I showed. That's more like a reward state and that's an actor. Um, that's how the game like game yeah. That's actually more intuitive for us to look and learn. Uh, it's, it's one of the fun things to, to look at. Um, 
Yeah, they, uh, yeah, they, uh, uh, I was supposed to say something. Uh, the, uh, uh, Sagan's question was, uh, uh, ultimately, is the result of weights. Yes. So, the result of the weights, right? Uh, or the learning part of the weight. So, for people who are in the client side when you are dealing with things, right? One thing that you have, which you have to look for, uh, is like you know, whether we can actually take the weights. Yeah. For us, right? Uh, we are not taking the data out. We are taking the learning part of things out, which can be applied somewhere. So, any deals, new deals which you are trying to structure, what not and stuff, right? We need to think from that perspective. Uh, so that would help us to push a uh, little uh, ahead. Uh, uh, that's it's an IP. That's the IP. Yeah. It's an IP. <laughs> yeah. The architecture of the base. If that we can get, yeah, that's extremely well. Yeah. Actually, speaking to more, that was my learning that it's not that it's IP for that, but but let's say you solved an image processing problem, for example, first couple of years because they solve for simpler things are going to be quite 100 percent almost applicable to next image processing problem. So, point is that it's the problem could be very different, but if it is in similar domain, we get a lot out of those weights and we can reapply a lot of that. Um, so, yeah, uh, image we will have, I will get someone else to talk on that uh, subject. We are going to have a lot of external speakers coming on, coming in to talk about uh, these things. 